We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would confirm our faith in these things, strengthen us, and ever cause us to be thankful for your rich wonders of grace so that we may never fall prey to seeking spiritual sustenance from worldly things. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now we are on page 463, uh, and, and we are studying the small called articles. These are Luther's, Luther's uh, articles of faith that he drew up in case there was ever a general council where the Lutherans would be allowed to make their case before the Pope and the Cardinals of the pap Papal Church. So last week, uh, last week we, we studied the introduction and we read through the first and second parts that talk about the Holy Trinity and about Jesus and justification by grace through faith. Then we got right in to the, the beginning of this, the article of the Mass. All right, and this, is, this, is, this surprises a lot of modern people because when modern people think of the Roman Catholic Mass, they think of just a church service like our service. And as a matter of fact, there's a lot of similarities between the Roman Catholic Mass and the Lutheran Divine Service. They're both very similar in structure, right? But the Mass, the Roman Mass, is not simply a, an order of worship. The Roman Mass has behind it the idea that we must do certain things in order to merit God's grace, all right? That God gives grace through the word and sacraments, but that we have to do things in order to earn it and to merit it. So there is always, for example, in the Roman mass, the priest is acting like an Old Testament priest. He is making a sacrifice on our behalf, uh, but it's not a blood sacrifice. He is actually offering the body and blood of Jesus Christ to God on our behalf. All right, so the priest is doing something uh, that if we are there and participating, we are meriting God's grace by our participation, all right? So the idea behind the Mass is this from us to God direction. Whereas in the Lutheran, in the Lutheran divine service, all right, the reason we call it a divine service is because God, the divine one, is serving us. He's coming to us in the word and in the sacrament to give us his grace as a free gift. We don't earn or deserve anything. He gives it to us as a free gift and he strengthens our faith and he, and, and he gives us new insights, knowledge and understanding and comforts our hearts and all of these wonderful things are because God is coming to us and giving us what we need, but what we don't deserve, but he graciously gives it to us for Christ's sake. So the entire direction of what's going on is different. The Roman Mass is always us to God, and then God to us, but also, but chiefly us to God. I am earning merit with God. I am, I am uh, doing things that God responds to, right? As if God reacts, you know. God, God is not a reactor, by the way, all right? God is always proactive. So, 
So anyway, that's the thing about the Mass that people don't understand because outwardly, it just looks like a worship service, right? You know, so what's Luther complaining about with this whole Mass thing? Uh, and why does he call it the most horrible abomination as it directly and powerfully conflicts with this chief article? And yet, above and before all other popish idolatries, it has been the chief and most specious. So the worst thing about the papal church is the mass, right? That's what he's saying. Um, for it has been held that this sacrifice or work, notice those two words, this sacrifice or work of the mass, even though it be rendered by a wicked scoundrel, frees men from sins, both in this life and also in purgatory, while only the Lamb of God shall and must do this. All right, so the Mass replaces Jesus. All right, the Mass is said to do for you what only Jesus can do for you. All right, as has been said above. Of this article, nothing is to be surrendered or conceded because the first article does not allow it. So the article about salvation through faith in Jesus directly contradicts the, 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 the theology of the papal mass. And that's why Luther is so vociferous about this. All right, now, second paragraph. If perchance there were reasonable papists we might speak moderately and in a friendly way. Thus, first, why do they so rigidly uphold the Mass? For it is but a pure invention of men and has not been commanded by God. Why are they so persnickety about the Mass? Because it's, uh, even though it's only an invention of men and has not been commanded by God, and every invention of man may be, may be, we may safely discard, as Christ declares, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So the first thing that Luther wants us to know here about the Mass is that it's a human invention that's not commanded by God. Right, number one. Secondly, it is an unnecessary thing which can be omitted without sin and without danger. All right? So why do they defend the Mass so rigidly when it's a thing that's not even necessary? All right? Thirdly, the sacrament can be received in a better, more blessed way, more acceptable to God, yea, the only blessed way according to the institution of Christ. All right? Why then do they drive the world to woe and misery on account of a fictitious, unnecessary matter which can be well obtained in another and more blessed way? Right? So they have the Lord's Supper, they have baptism, they have the creed, they have the Bible, but, they, but, but what happens is everything gets distorted when the truth is twisted. Right? And it's not twisted so much that everybody lo looks at it and goes, oh, see what they're twisting? It's twisted just enough to, to throw things doctrinally and spiritually out of whack, but in a way that most people don't even notice. Right? And so here, Luther says, the sacrament can be had in a much better way. What's he talking about? He's talking about the simple idea of the divine service that when we gather as a church we are not performing something for God essentially we are coming like hungry cattle to the feeding stalls of God's grace we are coming we are coming like patients uh, into a hospital where we are to receive the benefits of the, the medicine of the souls, all right? When we gather as a church, we are coming to receive something from God. That's why we gather. 
And in the preaching and reading and singing of the word, which is what all of our hymns should be and are, you know, all of our hymns should be this, our entire liturgy is this, and the scripture readings are this, and the sermon is this. So all of the whole structure of the liturgy is the word of God that is being ministered to us and what is happening in that ministration, the Holy Spirit is coming to us, you see, and, and he is meeting our need with his grace, forgiveness, life, salvation, etc. And therefore, the direction is not what we're doing for God. We don't, we don't come to church to do God a favor. Let's go to church and show God that we like him, you know. We don't want him to get grumpy. You know how he gets a little moody whenever we don't say, we love you, God, right? Remember, God doesn't need anything, right? God is entirely self-sufficient. He doesn't need our praise. We need to praise him. He doesn't need our praise, right? He is perfectly glorious if we never made a peep. But the fact of the matter is, we were created in order to praise God and to glorify God and to, and, and to receive all, all that we need from the Lord God. And that's the key to our Lutheran divine service. We come as beggars to be fed. We come as, as those who are in need in order to have our needs met. God is the one who is performing the gracious act upon us, not because of our deserving, but because of his mercy. All right, that's the better way that Luther means in this paragraph. All right, next paragraph. Let it be publicly preached to the people that the mass as man's twaddle can be omitted without sin. All right, so it's a human invention and don't feel guilty if you, uh, if you don't have anything to do with it. It can be omitted without sin, and that no one will be condemned who does not uh, observe it, but that he can be saved in a better way without the Mass. I wager that the Mass will then collapse of itself, not only among the insane common people, but also among all the pious, Christian, reasonable, God-fearing hearts. And that the more, whenever, when they would hear uh, that the mass is a dangerous thing, fabricated and invented without the will and word of God. So it's a form of worship that is distorted and wrong-headed. It's, it's fabricated and invented without God's will and without God's word. Now, ju just a little thing here in case you're wondering. Uh, so the, the small called articles are written in German and then they are tr later they were translated into Latin. So there's two different editions of the small called articles, the, the base German text and then the later translated Latin text. And so, or maybe the other way around, I can't remember at the moment. But anyway, so when you see these square brackets, these words in square brackets, that's when, uh, that's when the other translation has a different way of phrasing things. So when you read, you can skip over those square brackets because those square brackets are just saying, uh, depending upon which document you're reading, the Latin says this, this is what the German says, this is what the Latin says, or this is what the German says, you see? And so the square brackets, when you're reading, you can skip over them uh, to basically stick with the main text that's not bracketed, all right? Fourthly, since such innumerable and unspeakable abuses have arisen in the whole world from the buying and selling of masses, the mass should by right be relinquished, if for no other purpose than to prevent abuses, even though it 
in itself, it had something advantageous and good. How much more ought we to relinquish it so as to prevent forever these horrible abuses, since it is altogether unnecessary, useless, and dangerous, and we can obtain everything in, by a more necessary, profitable, and certain way without the mass. So, uh, and then fifthly, he says, since the mass is nothing else and can be nothing else than a work of men by which one attempts to reconcile himself and others to God, and to obtain and merit the remission of sins and grace. For thus the Mass is observed when it is observed at the very best. Otherwise, what purpose would it serve? For this very reason it must and should be condemned and rejected. For this directly conflicts the chief article, which says that it is not that it is not a wicked or godly hireling of the mass which, with his own work, but the Lamb of God and the Son of God that taketh away our sins. All right, so you get what he's saying here? He gets down to the brass tacks here in, fit, in the fifth thing. He says, the mass is a work of men by which one attempts to reconcile himself to God. All right, the mass. And that's why you can buy masses in the, in, in the Roman church. You can send offerings that will pay for a priest to say private masses for your uncle or aunt who is in purgatory. All right? So... Uh, you know, in, in the Roman Catholic Church, when you die, unless you're an extreme saint, when you die, you go to purgatory. And in purgatory, you suffer and, and pay for sins that you've committed on earth. You pay for those things in purgatory by being punished. Purgatory is like hell, but temporary. And, uh, and so, if you are a good Catholic, you want to shorten your uncle and your aunt's time in purgatory, so you send offerings to pay for priests to say private masses, and they do the mass all by themselves alone, and they do masses in the name of your uncle or aunt or whoever it is that you have. That's why if you go to a Catholic funeral, they have these things called mass cards. You know, what is a mass card? A mass card is not just a little thing that you get to show, see, I was at the funeral. A mass card is for you to sign up to have masses said for the dead, all right? Uh, and a lot of money is made uh, in this, in this trafficking in masses. Imagine, imagine how much money comes in to a church from people who are all concerned that grandma is still in purgatory. Right? Now, there is no such thing as purgatory. Right? Purgatory is a human fiction. All right? uh, but, you know, just so you know. Right? Only the Lamb of God only the Lamb of God, the Son of God, can take away our sins. And he does that when we believe in him, right? But if anyone should advance the pretext that as an act of devotion he wishes to administer the sacrament or communion to himself, he is not in earnest. So Luther goes on from talking about the Mass to... Should I give myself Holy Communion? All right? In other words, you know, like during the pandemic, should the father of a family gather his family together on Sunday morning and do the Lord's Supper with his children because he's the father and the head of the house? Should, he, should the Lord's Supper be celebrated 
uh, apart from the, the gathered congregation, and Luther here says, by no means. All right, there is no command of God uh, for such private use of the sacrament. Now, when a pastor takes the sacrament to a person who is ill, who cannot come to the gathered church, the pastor, because he is the public representative of the congregation, when he comes with the sacrament, he comes bringing the whole congregation with him. He's not just bringing himself and the Lord's Supper as a private thing. He is the pastor of the congregation bringing, bringing the same sacrament that the congregation has celebrated. He is bringing that to the person who is unable to be present. All right? It is a public ministry of the word of God, not a private use of communion. You understand the difference? All right. Private use of God's word is when you at home read your Bible and pray. Right. Um, public use of the word of God is when you come to church or to Bible class and you and you hear and you receive the word of God and you make use of the word of God and grow in it as as part of the gathered congregation. That's the public use of the word of God and the private use. But there is no private use for Holy Communion. All right? There is no private use of Holy Communion. So Luther wants uh, us to understand that in the, Roman, in the Roman church, when you have a priest sitting all by himself in a room privately, saying one mass after another, and taking the sacrament himself in the name of people's relatives uh, to shorten their time in purgatory, these, these practices are not according to the institution of Christ. The sacrament was instituted for the gathered Christians to come and receive together the Lord's Supper, not for us to use privately, all right? Uh, for if he wishes to commune in sincerity, all right, uh, and the surest and best way for him is in the sacrament and ministered according to Christ's institution. But that one administer communion to himself is a human notion, uncertain, unnecessary, yea, even prohibited. And he does not know what he is doing. Because without the word of God, he obeys a false human opinion and an invention. So too, it is not right for one to use the common sacrament of the church according to his own private devotion and without God's word and apart from the communion of the church to trifle with it. All right, so here Luther is very adamant. We are not as individual Christians to use the sacrament in private for our own personal devotion. Sacrament is a, is a thing that belong, is the common use of the whole church and therefore it belongs to the whole community and the right way to use it is when we are gathered together. Right. If for some reason we cannot, we cannot gather, and we cannot therefore receive the Lord's Supper. We need not despair and think that we are missing uh, something as if God's grace is now barred from us. No, because the same grace of God that is given in the sacrament of the altar is given through the word and the preaching of the word and, and the hearing of the word. So God gives us forgiveness, life, and salvation in baptism, in the word of God, and in the sacrament of the altar. And therefore, 
even if we cannot receive, for some reason we cannot receive the sacrament, if we use God's word, we receive the same grace of God that we receive in the sacrament. In the sacrament, that grace of God is sealed to us in the sacramental act, but the same grace is given in word and in sacrament. As long as you have the word, even if you cannot have the sacrament, you have God's grace. All right. All right then he goes down. Uh, this article of the Mass will be the whole business of the council. He says, when it, whenever this council actually happens, if it ever does, uh, this will be the only thing they'll want to talk about. For if it were possible for them to concede to us all the other articles, yet they could not concede this. So Luther says, I've, I've said it right up front so that we're not kidding anybody here. All right? Uh, they can never concede to what I'm saying about the Mass. As Campeggius said at Augsburg, that he would be torn in pieces before he would relinquish the Mass, so by the help of God, I too would suffer myself to be reduced to ashes before what I would allow a hireling of the Mass, be he good or bad, to be made equal to Christ Jesus, my Lord and Savior, or to be exalted above him. Thus, we are and remain eternally separated and opposed to one another. All right? As long as, as long as they claim what they claim and we claim what we claim, we're on two different roads. All right? We're on two different roads. We are eternally separated and opposed to each other. They feel well enough that when the mass falls, the papacy lies in ruins. Before they will permit this to occur, they will put us all to death if they can. All right? So Luther really kind of comes right out and says it there. Right? And then he goes on, in addition to all this dragon's tail, I mean the mass, has, got, has begotten numerous vermin brood of manifold idolatries. Now Luther is starting to get warmed up, all right? You know, sometimes when you read Luther, you gotta, you gotta read a couple of chapters before he gets warmed up. And now he basically says, uh, in addition to all this, this dragon's tail, he calls the mass a dragon's tail, he says, has begotten numerous vermin brood. So there's things that the mass has created, all right? First, purgatory. Here they carried their trade into purgatory by masses for souls and vigils and weekly, monthly, and yearly celebrations of obsequies and finally, by the common week and all souls day, by soul baths, so that the mass is used almost alone for the dead. Although Christ has instituted the sacrament for the living. All right, so Christ institutes it for the living, but it's more important uh, in this use of the mass to get dead people's souls out of purgatory, right? So they've invented all kinds of practices and observances that are all geared to using the mass, which is for the living, in order to benefit the dead, right? Therefore, purgatory and every solemnity, rite, and commerce connected with it is to be regarded as nothing but a specter of the devil. Right? Purgatory is a specter of the devil. Specter is a ghost, right? For it conflicts with the chief article that we're saved by grace through faith in Christ, right? It, it, it conflicts with the chief article which teaches that only Christ and not the works of men are to help free souls. Not to mention the fact that nothing has been divinely commanded or enjoined upon us 
concerning the dead. All right? We have no promise and no command with regard to the dead. All right? uh, and therefore, we, you know, when, when somebody dies, we must remember that they are either in hell or they are in heaven. If they are in heaven, they do not need your prayers. And if they are in hell, your prayers will never do them any good. Right? Uh, so, so there are no commands in the Bible with respect to our benefiting people who are dead. Uh, that's a human invention. Therefore, all this may be safely omitted, e even if it were no error and idolatry. The papists here quote Augustine and some of the fathers who are said to have written concerning purgatory, and they think that what we, they think that we do not understand for what purpose and what end they spoke as they did. Saint Augustine does not write that there is a purgatory, nor has he a testimony of scripture to constrain him thereto, but he leaves it in doubt whether there is one and says that his mother asked to be remembered at the altar or sacrament. Now all this is indeed nothing but the devotion of men, and that too of individuals, and does not establish an article of faith, which is the prerogative of God alone. So he's saying here, so Augustine's mother said, when you're taking the Lord's Supper, remember me, All right? Which is, it's kind of an odd thing to say, but you know, Luther, Luther says here, the opinions of men do not make doctrine. Only God's word makes doctrine. So if you can find some church father who said something of his own opinion about something, just because it comes out of the mouth of St. Augustine or Chrysostom or goodness knows whatever church father, doesn't make it so, because sometimes they are only expressing their own opinion, all right? Doctrine is created by the Word of God, not by the opinions of men, all right? That's what Luther is saying here. He goes on and he says, our papists, however, cite such statements, opinions of men, in order that men should believe their horrible, blasphemous, cursed traffic in masses for souls in purgatory, etc. But they will never prove these things from Augustine. Now, when they have abolished the traffic in masses for purgatory, of which Augustine never dreamt, we will then discuss with them whether the expressions of Augustine without scripture are to be admitted and whether the dead should be remembered at the Eucharist. For it will not do to frame articles of faith from the works or words of the Holy Fathers. Otherwise, their kind of fare, of garments, of house, etc., would have to become an article of faith. If they're, in other words, what he's saying here is, if the private opinions of the ancient church fathers established a doctrine, then the kind of food that they ate, the kind of clothes that they wear, would also establish doctrine, would also become doctrinal. We'd have to eat what they ate and wear what they wore, uh, and, uh, and before you know it, the world would be filled with, with things created from the opinions of men rather than from the commandment of God. All right? The rule is, he says at the end of the paragraph, the rule is the word of God shall establish articles of faith 
and no one else, not even an angel. Remember that St. Paul in the book of Galatians, he said, he said to the Galatian Christians, he said, even if we or an angel of God came to you with any other gospel than the one that you have received already, let him be accursed. All right? So, so that's what Luther is referring to. Only God's word establishes doctrines, not the opinions of church fathers. Right? As long as the church fathers proclaim God's word, they, their doctrine is sound. But when they are voicing their own personal private opinions, their opinions mean nothing. Right? Secondly, from this, it has followed that evil spirits have perpetuated much knavery by appearing as the souls of the departed and with unspeakable lies and tricks demanded masses, vigils, pilgrimages, and other alms, all of which we had to receive as articles of faith and live accordingly. And the Pope confirmed these things, as also the Mass and all other abominations. Here, too, there is no yielding or surrendering. So he says the second thing about this whole purgatory thing is that you have devils, right? You have demons who appear as departed loved ones. You know, so somebody goes to a seance. And they bring up Uncle Joe, right? And Uncle Joe comes and he, he speaks. He speaks from the dead to people. That's not Uncle Joe. That's a demon leading you away from God's word and making you think you're having a spiritual experience when you're having a demonic experience. The dead do not come back and talk to us, all right? And once you are dead, you are dead, all right? And, uh, and, and therefore, uh, in order to extend the doctrine of purgatory, which is nothing more than works righteousness, that's what purgatory is, works righteousness. What, if you believe in Jesus, what are you doing in purgatory? Right? Are you saved by grace through faith, or are you not? It flat out contradicts the gospel that you still have to pay for your own sins when you die. All right? that, what did Jesus die on the cross for then? Right? Uh, and, uh, and so we have to grab hold of this thing. So, in order to further the abomination and self-righteousness and works righteousness of the mass, purgatory is invented, and demonic spirits masquerade as, the, as your dead relatives in order to come to you and to make you think that you can have contact with the world beyond based on your own works, all right? So, we can't surrender that. Number three, we have a few minutes left. Thirdly, the pilgrimages. You really want to help Grandma? You really want to assure your way into heaven? Go on a holy pilgrimage to a holy place, and when you get there, do all of the holy things that are prescribed to you at that place, and you will be gaining a treasury of merit by going on the pilgrimage and observing all of the lighting of the candles and the giving of offerings and all of the prayers that you will say at the various places where you're supposed to stop and say prayers. All of these things on a pilgrimage they all are basically working merit. They are working benefit for you and for your deceased loved ones. All right? 
So he says, uh, pilgrimage are another one of these devil spawn. Here too, masses, remission of sins, the grace of God were sought, for the mass controlled everything. Now it is indeed certain that such pilgrimages without the word of God have not been commanded, neither are they necessary. So God never commanded us to go on pilgrimages, and they are not necessary for us to do. Since we can have these things in a better way and can omit these pilgrimages without any sin and danger. Why, therefore, do they leave at home their own parishes, the called ministers and their parishes, the word of God, wives, children, etc., who are ordained and commanded, and run after these unnecessary, uncertain, pernicious will of the wisps of the devil. All right, so Luther is saying, you have your home parish where the word of God is preached every Sunday and where the sacraments are administered according to the institution of Christ. You do not need anything else than that to be kept in the faith and strengthened in the faith. Unless you happen to go to a church where God's word is not taught and the sacraments are not rightly administered. Uh, but such is not the case here, thanks be to God. All right. So here he's saying, you don't need a pilgrimage. You don't need special holy observances. You just need the word and the sacraments which are being given to you every week in the parish to which you belong and therefore you don't need to be running hither and thither after the will of the wisps of the devil unless the devil was riding the pope causing him to praise and establish these practices whereby the people again and again revolted from christ to their own works that's what's always at the bottom of it all People want to do things by their own works. They think that they must deserve something. They can earn favor with God by their works. Let me, let me do a little pilgrimage, and that'll, that'll get God off my back for the next year or two. All right? If I go on this pilgrimage and see the holy relics. Right? And they become idolaters, which is worse of all. Moreover, it is ne neither necessary nor commanded, but is useless and doubtful, and besides, harmful. Hence, here too, there can be no yielding or surrendering, uh, etc. And let this be preached, that, the, that such pilgrimages are not necessary but dangerous, and then see what will become of them. Uh, and then... Uh, I think we'll we'll leave it at number four there on 467. We will take it up there next week. All right. But anyway, as a concluding matter today, notice how vehement Luther is about the Roman mass and all of the little tentacles, all of the little things that spring from it. The core of it all is works righteousness. Taking, taking the, the gospel free gifts of grace and turning them into something that we by our works earn. All right? it's, a, it's a total distortion of the key doctrine of the Christian faith. All right, amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever.